poem or illustrate a point, so the biblical writers use external material to draw attention and make a statement. Paul quotes from pagan Greek poets. The psalmists and prophets borrow vocabulary and paraphrase material from ancient Egyptian, Mesopotamian, and Syrian literature. Jew quotes a book from the Pseudepigrapha, ancient writings that falsely claim authorship by a biblical character. The people of biblical times knew the quoted material wasn't inspired, but it had meaning for them and their audience. In other words, the biblical author's use of Enoch is best compared to other instances where they used extra biblical material to drive home a point. As Heiser explains, their use of extra biblical material does not require that the authors believe the material was inspired. It would be like a pastor today quoting a popular movie. Plus, in Acts 17, Paul quotes pagan works to make a point in Athens. But that doesn't mean pagan literature is scripture. Some might point to Matthew 22, where the Sadducees ask Jesus a question in an attempt to trap him. Jesus responds with, You are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. Then it appears he references the book of Enoch. So wouldn't this imply Jesus thought Enoch was scripture? Well, this would be to quote mine the passage. When Jesus used the scriptures, he quoted from them directly. In verse 30, he doesn't say something like, Have you not read? But simply states a fact about the resurrection that he is aware of. Then we see the scriptures he is referring to, which is brought up in verse 31 to 32. If Jesus was quoting from 1st Enoch, he would have quoted it directly, like he does just after this with Exodus 3.6. And he would have done so by saying something like, It is written, or have you not read? Instead, in verse 30, Jesus' reference about the resurrected body is just a fact he is aware of, that was also referring to, which is brought up in verse 31 to 32. If Jesus was quoting from 1st Enoch, have you not read? But simply states a fact about the resurrection that he is aware of the scriptures, nor the power of God. Then it appears he references the book of Enoch. So wouldn't this imply Jesus thought Enoch was scripture? Well, this would be to quote mine the passage. When Jesus used the scriptures, he quoted from them directly. In verse 30, he doesn't say something like, have you not read? but simply states a fact about the resurrection that he is aware of. Then we see the scriptures he is referring to, which is brought up in verse 31 to 32. If Jesus was quoting from 1st Enoch, he would have quoted it directly, like he does just after this with Exodus 3, 6. And he would have done so by saying something like, it is written, or have you not read? Instead, in verse 30, Jesus' reference about the resurrected body is just a fact he is aware of that was also common in Jewish thought, and it is not just contained in the book of Enoch. So it is not something he is saying he is getting from the scriptures. The scriptures he is referring to are clearly brought up after this and directly quoted, and first Enoch isn't quoted here. Thus, in conclusion, we can't appreciate the book of Enoch for what it is, but we must also recognize what it is not. The book of Enoch is not authoritative scripture. There is no evidence it was significant to Christ or the apostles. And it contradicts their teachings in some places. Enoch gives us valuable insight concerning the beliefs of the culture and the time period that produced it. But the same culture also reveals they did not yes. consider it to be the word of God. Discipleship model. Now, the controversy surrounding Francis Chan is that in recent years, he has accepted invitations to speak at conferences where he has shared the stage with many Bible teachers who many in the evangelical space would label as false teachers, people like Todd White or people like Benny Hinn or Bill Johnson from Bethel Church. And while he is on stage, it seems on the surface that he may be endorsing these men and their ministry.
Ministries. Here's a clip. The other thought I had as I'm watching all this, gosh, there has been some amazing teaching today. Man, I, that was the first time I heard Daniel. I was like, whoa, he is bringing it. That's the first time I heard Todd preach live, and I'm going, oh my gosh, these are bold, bold men of God that are not backing down. They're just laying it out fearlessly, and I'm so grateful for that, but it made me think. So the question is, is Francis Chan endorsing these men? If so, does that qualify him as a false teacher? Well, after this was done, Francis Chan responded with an article on his website, and I'm going to read quite a bit of it, but I'm going to link the entire article in the description below so that you can read the entire thing. He says, I am asked to speak at approximately 500 events a year. I decline approximately 90% of the requests. It's a difficult thing to do. Oftentimes, I decline because other speakers will be at the event who believe almost exactly what I believe. My reasoning is that it may be a waste of kingdom resources for all of us to be there speaking largely to people who already agree with us. It seems more effective to speak where there is less Bible teaching. It has not been my practice to ask who will share the platform with me and to research the other speakers. While some may be dear friends, there are many that I know little about. This current experience has caused me to consider exercising more caution and to develop a team to help me research. That being said, I speak in many places where I am not in alignment theologically. I actually believe that is where I can be most effective as long as they give me freedom to address anything I believe the Lord wants me to address. And then later on in the article, Chan says this, I recognize now more than ever that sometimes my participation can give the impression that I align with every other speaker at the event. I'm not sure what to do about that other than to tell you that I don't. Unless the elders of my church direct me differently, I will continue to be found preaching in venues with those I disagree. I will preach in just about any kind of setting if I'm given freedom to preach from any passage of scripture. The elders and I are trying to come up with more safeguards for future events to hopefully prevent misunderstanding. Pray for us. Now there may be some other concerns with Francis Chan, but the question is this. Is this enough to label Francis Chan as a false teacher, keeping in mind that Jesus oftentimes was found hanging out with people who Christians during this day would consider to be false teachers. Even one time, Jesus went over to the home of a Pharisee and broke bread with them. Would we have excommunicated Jesus and called him a false teacher if Jesus took a selfie with that Pharisee? So, is Francis Chan a false teacher because he associates or shares the platform with other people who we may consider to be false teachers? Um, I'm going to reserve that to a little bit later on in this video. Next up on the list is well-known megachurch pastor of Elevation Church, Stephen Furtick. Now, Stephen Furtick has been largely criticized also because of some of the prosperity preachers that he aligns or associates with up to, namely Bishop T.D. Jakes and Joel Osteen. In addition to that, Furtick has been largely criticized for some very significant theological errors. In one sermon that he preached called Ghosted, he was criticized for teaching this heretical doctrine of modalism, which is the idea that God the Father doesn't really exist in three persons. He just changes forms, and so sometimes he's God the Father, and then at other times he's God the Son, and then at other times he is God the Holy Spirit, and he exists in these three modes, but not these three modes or persons, if you will, uh, at the same time. And here's a clip of what Furtick said. Now Jesus is taken from their sight and hidden in a cloud, but he did not leave. He just changed forms. He did not disappear. He just was no longer visible. Instead, he was internal. Now, to be fair to Stephen Furtick, I think it's a stretch to automatically label him as a false teacher simply because he used the phrase, Jesus has changed forms, right? You could make an argument that Jesus changed forms from being uh, in the flesh. 
flesh, human body, to actually ascending to heaven. You can make an argument for that. So I don't think that this little sound bite, this clip enough, is really uh, sufficient to basically say that Stephen Furtick is a false teacher. But there is another clip a couple years ago where Stephen Furtick basically made a bold statement and said, God broke the law for love. Here is the clip. You're probably familiar with it. And what will really turn your heart to God is not when you hear his laws, which were given for our good, by the way, but they were powerless because there wasn't enough leverage in our action to keep the law. So what God did when he sent his son, and this is why we get excited in church, and this is why tears fill our eyes when we think about Jesus, and this is why the gospel is still good news in the world today, because God broke the law for love. I said to every sinner, God broke the law for love. Now, I'm not exactly sure what verdict is referring to here as it relates to God breaking the law for love. But what I believe he's saying is that God gave us the moral law, thou shalt not murder. But then God put his own son on the cross and murdered him as an expression or a display of his love for us. And in doing so, God can be found guilty of breaking the law for love. Now, I don't believe I would have ever painted the picture or communicated in any way that God was guilty of breaking the law because that communicates that God has a relationship with the law that he doesn't have. God is not under any sort of law like we are, and so therefore God can't be guilty of ever breaking the law. But there are several other things that Stephen Furtick has been criticized for, like teaching a man-centered gospel and many of his sermons being man-centered. But is that enough to label Stephen Furtick as a false teacher? I'm going to reserve my final verdict on Stephen Furtick for a little bit later in this video. Number four on this list is current megachurch pastor Andy Stanley. Now, Andy Stanley is the son of the world-famous Baptist preacher Dr. Charles Stanley, who, by the way, if you type his name into the YouTube search bar, followed by the letter F, you'll also see Dr. Charles Stanley, false teacher. Now, Andy Stanley has also largely been criticized for some things that he has said regarding the relationship of the believer to the Old Testament, and it seems on the surface that he is suggesting that the entire Bible is no longer inspired and that Christians should really only see value or have relationship with the New Testament, and we need to unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. Here's a short clip on what Andy Stanley said about the Old Testament. The Old Covenant Law of Moses was not the go-to source regarding sexual behavior in the church. More importantly, <laughs> And perhaps more disturbingly, if that's a word, or offensively, the Old Testament, or the Law and the Prophets, as they called it, was not going to be the go-to source for any behavior in the church. Now, to make this point, because this is so important, I originally, in my notes, I was going to put a screen up here that said, in other words, that means, thou shalt not obey the Ten Commandments. But I knew someone would take a picture of that. And it would define me for the rest of my life. So I'm not going to put it up there. But I want you to hear me say it. Here's what the Jerusalem Council was saying to the Gentiles. You are not accountable to the Ten Commandments. You're not accountable to the Jewish law. We're done with that. God has done something new. And then later on he says this. Thou shalt not obey the Ten Commandments because those aren't your commandments. Yours are better. And yours are far less complicated but they are far more demanding. Finally, later on in the sermon, he says this. Peter, James, Paul elected to unhitch the Christian faith from their unhitch scriptures. And my friends, we must as well. Now, I may get in trouble for this, but I agree with Stanley in the sense that the requirements of the New Covenant are certainly less complicated but more demanding than that of the Old Testament. Let me explain. In the Old Testament, you can obey the Ten Commandments, and at the end of the day, you feel like you are a good saint. But in the New Testament, God doesn't give us a list of do's and don'ts, essentially, or a whole bunch of laws. He says the law is written on your heart. And he says, I'm going to give you two of them, love God and love your neighbor. 
And so that way, even though it's less complicated, it's much more demanding because it's a whole lot more difficult at the end of the day to check off those two boxes and say, I've loved God with all of my heart and I've loved all of my neighbors. And so I don't believe that Stanley is saying that there is no value at all in the Old Testament. I believe what he's saying is that there is a new covenant and therefore God relates to his people in a new way. For instance, if somebody in the church is caught in adultery, we don't look to the Old Testament as uh, it relates to what we should do or instructions on how to handle that person. Because if that was the case, half the people in the church would have to be stoned right now. We don't look to the Old Testament for our instructions. No, the church looks to the New Testament in terms of how to deal with somebody who may be caught in adultery. But I don't believe we can take these sound bites from Andy Stanley and suggest that he's a false teacher because he is saying that the Old Testament doesn't have any value. I just don't believe that's what he was really actually trying to communicate whenever he said this. So, is Andy Stanley a false teacher? I'm going to have to say no. I don't believe he's a false teacher for the reasons why people say that he is. Next up on the list is number five, Tim Mackey, the lead narrator at the Bible Project YouTube channel, which has over two million subscribers. But don't forget, we got number six. Number six is going to shock you, so stick around to the end of the video. Now, over the past few years, Tim's views on some very significant theological topics have come into question. Here's a clip of him describing hell. If you look at the first sentence of the Bible, it says, In the beginning, God made heavens and... What does it not say? It doesn't say, In the beginning, God made heaven and earth and hell. God didn't make... Whatever hell is, God didn't make it. It's nowhere to be found on page one of your Bible, right? What God made is heaven and earth, and what does God think about it? It's very good. It's very good. So whatever hell is, it comes into the story later. And if you're familiar with the story, how it works, hell, or evil, or sin, the various names that it's called in the Bible, is something that humans have created by our decision to seize autonomy from God. Now, I personally do not agree with Tim Mackey on this. I don't believe that hell is just some place that we as humans have created. I don't believe that hell is uh, synonymous with evil or sin in the Bible. I don't see anywhere in the Bible where uh, the scriptures are equating sin with hell or evil with hell. I also believe that Jesus was very clear in Matthew 25, 41, that hell was a place prepared for the devil and his angels, not necessarily something that we have created. So I don't necessarily agree with Tim Mackey's position or what seems to be on the surface his position on hell. Tim Mackey has also been largely criticized for not discussing the idea that Jesus' death on the cross was a propitiation for sin, which is the idea that when Jesus died, he didn't just die to pay a debt. Rather, he satisfied the wrath of God, offering up his life on the cross as a payment for our sin. So, once again, uh, is this enough to label Tim Mackey as a false teacher? Uh, he satisfied the wrath of God, he died to pay a debt, but rather he satisfied the wrath of God by offering up his life on the cross as a payment for our sin. So, once again, uh, is this enough to label Tim Mackey as a false teacher? Um, I'm going to reserve that to a little bit later on in this video. And finally, number six on this list, a well-known Bible teacher that Jesus has Christ been criticized as being Jesus a Christ, false teacher Jesus is... Christ Christ has it back. You guessed it, yours truly, Alan Parr. Lord because Jesus if Christ you go over to the YouTube search bar and you type in Alan Parr space F, you will see people who have made videos about me, Alan Parr, claiming that I am a false teacher. And most of the videos that they make are surrounding the idea of eternal security or once saved, always saved. And people will claim that I am literally leading people to hell because I'm too soft on sin and that I believe that people can just 
live any kind of way they want to. They can sin, they can be a, whatever they want to do, and they can go to heaven and there's no accountability. Anybody who's watching my videos for anything they want to do, and they can go to heaven and there's no accountability. Anybody who's watching my videos for any length of time knows that that is not my position. I am really hard on sin. I talk about sin all the time, and I think what they are doing is they are misunderstanding the doctrine of eternal security. I have several videos on my YouTube channel where I talk about that. But if you are going to label Alan Parr as a false teacher for being a proponent or a teacher of eternal security, then you're going to have to go down the list and you're going to have to label Dr. Tony Evans, Dr. Charles Swindoll, Dr. David Jeremiah, Dr. Charles Stanley, Paul Washer, <coughs> Bauckham, Todd Friel, and John MacArthur, all as being false teachers because all of us teach the doctrine of eternal security. And you'd also have to wipe out about probably 60 to 80% of the world's best Bible teachers.
I guess I stabbed God. I don't know, but I was like, no, I'm never going to love again. And in that moment, like, it was so traumatic. I felt a person break from my body and literally just like leave, like fly up. And then I felt myself like fall. It was like I broke and I fell from, in, in my mind, I, I, I thought it was Jesus. I guess I knew it was Jesus somehow that I have fallen from Jesus and I've fallen from heaven and that I just fell spiritually I just fell into darkness and in that moment I, I just felt like 10 or plus demons or evil spirits enter my body and it was really scary uh, but also in that moment that I felt like my whole spirit died like I felt so dead inside like I can't describe to you how terrible it was because like growing up with faith um I I felt alive I felt joy and love and I felt so much fruit of the spirit that God you know gave me and I was at some points in my life I was very you know growing up kind and I just felt more in communion with God and just felt alive but like when I made that decision to never love again died inside like it was traumatic because i i also like didn't go to church or anything so i was like what's going on like this is weird like supernatural stuff and like i don't understand what's going on because i didn't really have that foundation to, or support to really understand but um yeah it was just really traumatic and my whole spirit died and like I don't know if anyone else has had a similar experience, but it was kind of like a sudden, like I felt the Holy Spirit break and leave my body and I was left with just like death. And the Bible does say that, you know, if a righteous person does wicked things, they will die spiritually. And it also says that God is love. So by not, by choosing to never love again, you know, I was basically forsaking God. And I think that's why he took his spirit away from me and it wasn't even like 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 necessarily his um fault it was more like i chose not to to have communion with him by choosing to love again so yeah basically i just didn't have um a relationship with god after that i just thought god was mad at me and that he'd never want me back because I didn't even really know the gospel that well, and I just kind of lived like an atheist after that, you know, going to college, and just, like, I just thought I was, like, I just felt lost, and so, yeah, I just wanted to warn you that God can take his spirit away from you, and, like, even if you're a true believer, like, you can lose your salvation, because I, I did, I did lose the my salvation. And there's a lot of verses in the Bible about that. And I just wanted to warn people about um, the potentially false teachings of once saved, always saved, or eternal security, um, Calvinism, because, like, I, I'll go into, like, my testimony in another video, but it's, it's really, it really sounds like a teaching, like, that you're just saved and you can't lose your salvation you can just live like the devil, that you can not obey God, and that's just so unscriptural, like, just read through Matthew, um, there's so many verses about if you forsake God, he'll forsake you, or if you don't forgive others, you know, God won't forgive you, like, these are Bible verses, I think that one's Matthew 6, 14, 15, or, you know, if you don't obey God, like, you won't be in his kingdom, don't follow him and like turn from sin and repent and uh, I guess the good news is that like if you do ever lose God's spirit um, by renouncing your faith that he's always ready to welcome you back like the story of the prodigal son the prodigal son they said he was dead and now he's alive so he he died because he spiritually died oh, damn it. to live with uh, prostitutes or whatever he didn't physically die, he was spiritually dead. Just like how Adam and Eve spiritually died when they sinned against God. So, yeah, I just wanted to warn people that God can take away their, you know, eternal life uh, in Jesus and his Holy Spirit um, if you renounce your faith. And there's
there's no such thing. I'm starting to believe like there's no such thing as once saved, always saved, or eternal security. You're probably deceived and on your way to hell if you think that God has to give you grace and you're gonna just sin and God is just gonna have to give you grace and forgive you because that's not the gospel. That's not scriptural at all. Like it says that you're basically crucifying Christ again if you sin after knowing the truth and so yeah I just hope like this is a warning to people to repent and to just feel on alert because it was really traumatic when God took his spirit from me and it was like many years of, of darkness and um, luckily I did he did draw me back to him and I did end up turning to him and uh, that and I felt God I felt like a ball of love and energy. Uh, it was like a person you know, like jump into my body. And these are weird, super things. But like, I just felt like I never could talk about it because it was just so supernatural. And like, I didn't know like who to bring it up with. But yeah, um, I have a bunch of other like experiences that I'm willing to share in some future videos. Um, but for now, this one, I didn't want to make it too long. So. I'll still make the shit out of you. All I need to do is move his <laughs> All that was left of was two kings. I believe. 
believed in God and I was walking with him and I didn't I guess for some reason I didn't really um, think much of it because <coughs> I didn't grow up in a Christian home and it was just something I guess I adopted as a belief because of the community I was in a lot of people were Christian a lot of my friends were Christian so um, I just kind of believed it and I had a Bible in my house that I I just read it was in my room and I remember reading Matthew and Genesis and just like a lot of verses and just believing that it was the truth I didn't really question it when I was growing up I was just like yeah you know God exists he's Jesus Jesus rose from the dead like we should obey God but as I got older you know, I never went to church, and I, because my parents weren't Christian, no. and uh, I also had a very troubled family. It was very abusive. Um, I guess my my parents were very traditional Chinese parents, so it, it was just extremely cruel and, and emotionally painful. But I don't want to go into that in this video. But basically, um, I just found it harder and harder to really like love people because in my family I I was trying to love my parents and have a relationship with them but you know I, it, it was like difficult with with that type of parenting and I just got so angry make a one for the make and, make um, one for the ball make a one for the ball speak the wheeze Make a run for the balloon. 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 Make a run for the butter, make a run for the butter, but Louise. Um, I just made that decision kind of out of hate that I would never, out of hurt, that I would never love again. And I felt like so much like love from God in that moment, like trying really his hardest. I don't want to say trying his hardest, but like he was really pushing through in my heart, his love for me. And I was just like, no. And I stabbed it. Like, I, I don't even know how to. Because it's nothing physical that I did. It was just like in my heart and mind. But I stabbed that. I guess I stabbed God. I don't know. But I was like, no, I'm never going to love again. And in that moment, like, it was so traumatic. I felt a person break from my body and literally just like leave, like fly up. And then I felt myself like fall. It was like I broke and I fell from... It was Jesus. I guess I knew it was Jesus somehow that I have fallen from Jesus and I've fallen from heaven and that I just fell spiritually. I just fell into darkness and in that moment, like I just felt make like for the butter, ten or plus make a run for the butter, but it was my body. And it was really scary. Uh, but also in that moment that I felt like my whole spirit died. Like I felt so dead inside. Like, I can't describe to you how terrible it was because, like, growing up with faith, um, I, I felt alive. I felt joy and love, and I felt so much fruit of the Spirit that God, you know, gave me. And I was, at some points in my life, I was very, you know, growing up very kind, and I just felt more in communion with God and just felt alive. But, like, when I made that decision to never love again I died inside like it was traumatic because I, I also like didn't go to church or anything so I was like what's going on like this is weird like supernatural stuff and like I don't understand what's going on because I didn't really have that foundation to, or support to really understand but um, yeah it was just really traumatic and my whole spirit died and like I don't know has had a similar experience but it was kind of like a sudden like I felt the Holy Spirit break and leave my body and I was left with just like death and the Bible does say that you know if a righteous person does wicked things they will die spiritually and 
it also says that God is love. So by not, by choosing to never love again, you know, I was basically forsaking God. And I think that's why. Damn it. He took his spirit away from me and it wasn't even like, like, like necessarily his um, fault. It was more like I chose not to, to have communion with him by choosing not to love again. And so, yeah, basically, I just Fucking whore. didn't have um, a relationship with God after that. And I just thought God was mad at me and that he'd never want me back because I didn't even really know the gospel that well. Fuck and you. I just kind of lived like an atheist. So after a bitch. That, you know, going to college and just like, I just thought I was like, I just felt lost. And so, yeah, I just wanted to warn you that God can take his spirit away from you. And, like, even if you're a true believer, like, you can lose your salvation because I... Father's fucking sneezing. What a fucking night, so a bitch. Stupid. My dick is getting hard.
Check. How is that a checkmate? I guess I just wore him down till I broke him and knocked the door. I never saw that coming. He can't move here. He can't move here. He can't move here, here, or here, or here. I guess I just fucked this hole. Make a run for the sport of Louise. 